Oh, welcome everyone. Um, it's great to see so many of you joining us today. Um, it's really good to see uh, some familiar names as well. I think we've got some some applicants and some off holders joining us today and also some people who have shown some interest in our sustainable electrical power systems engineering course. So that's really nice to see that mix of applicants and interest there. Um, so my name is James. I am the course advisor for the online sustainable electrical power systems engineering course. Um, and I'm here to guide you through the application process, provide you with information about the course, fees, funding options, that kind of thing. So um, please feel free to contact me uh, after this webinar. You'll see my email address at the bottom of the screen there at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, we can always arrange a consultation to discuss the course um, further. And you can always just directly email me as well. Um, so our topic for today's webinar is um, a taste of lecture from our course director, James. So the today's theme is the aim of a sustainable electrical power system. So it's a really good opportunity to gain a good introduction to this topic. Um, and a real nice introduction to some of the things that you'll be studying on this um, online master's program. So um, James is the course director for our Sustainable Electric Power Systems Engineering course, um, and he's got a wealth of experience in this field. Um, so I'll pass you over to James for a minute just to give a little bit more background on um, his career and his uh, academic interests. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I realise it's confusing having the two people on this this call, uh, both called James. Um, yeah, so I am the the academic course director. I'm sort of responsible for the the overall view of the technical content and and sort of how how the course is is run. Um, and yeah, brief background in me. So um, I'm now a, a reader in electrical engineering. I uh, I run this uh, back when I did my PhD. It was quantifying risks with renewable power generation on the kind of what if sometime in the future we have a lot of wind power. Um, we do now, which is quite interesting. Um, but I spend most of my time now working in a, a, sec a secondary role as the academic lead for pedagogy. So I spend a lot of time looking at other courses and try and improve the way they they're taught. Um, I have a real interest in sort of how people learn and that kind of teaching process. And hopefully that's re reflected in the quality of the material you'll see on, on this MSC. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's a sort of brief background of myself. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, James. So, um, yeah, James will be talking to us today um, about the, um, the aims of a central electrical power system. Um, we'll also open things up to um, the Q and A, and so feel free to ask questions about the about the um, webinar topic, and also questions about our MSc course. And I'll just give a little bit more information about the MSc um, as well, so you can also feel free to ask questions about that. You've got the Q and A function, you've got the chat box as well. Um, but yeah, I'll pass you over again to James and. Uh, we'll get started with today's webinar. Brilliant, thank you. So, the there there isn't really one universal aim, but I thought this was quite a good um, topic to 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 give here. This is actually the first recorded video for those who join uh, the MSc. Um, this is a recorded video that will be very similar to what I present here, but it gives a nice overview to sort of the the main factors that i think are important it's really just an excuse to talk about the things that um i think are very important when thinking about power systems um not that there is one universally agreed on aim so here is the definition or the the aim that i've written reliably deliver electrical power to those who need it when they need it at a specific power quality or within a defined power quality, while minimizing environmental impact and minimizing cost. And for the rest of this, this lecture, I'm going to kind of go through the terms and just talk through each of those. Uh, but first, I just want to give a more colloquial aim that I've got some devices, and when I plug those in, 
I want them to work. I don't want to damage the component. I don't want to pay a lot for it. I don't want to damage the environment. I just want my devices to work. And there are, uh, you know, a sp there is specifications here of what making this device work means. So really here we're now talking about power quality. We're saying this device uh, expects 120 volts AC, so in a sine wave, at a particular frequency. So this one's 60 hertz, uh, as is this one. Um, and this one will consume 12 watts. Uh, this one, I think, says the max amps. Um, so it's got a maximum kind of capacity as well. So, but it's a bit more than that because these figures, the frequency, the voltage, the power factor, um, they're going to be continually varying. So yes, while the we're saying to to sort of be at the the meet the standard, we need a particular we need it to be a sine wave, the voltage and the current to be a sine wave. We need it to be a particular voltage, particular current frequency, and this angular difference between voltage and current defines the power factor. We need that to be within a certain bounds as well. Um, but it is within a certain bounds. You know, we might have. Well, what if the voltage is 2%, 5%, 20% above? Uh, so we're getting a, uh, a, a swell in voltage, an increase in voltage of a certain amount. Is that okay? What's an acceptable range? And the same for frequency. We could have an increase in frequency. So really what we're saying, maybe we look up some standards and say, okay, for, for this country, for this kind of set of standards, maybe our voltage can vary plus or minus 10% and our frequency can vary plus or minus 1%. But it's, it's not as simple as that either. As you can see here, this is a four cycle sag. It only lasts a short period of time. And you see this quite a lot. So here, this is a transient. This is something, uh, an event that occurs and decays away back to zero after a period of time. This is this particular one was a capacitor bank energization. So switches on, energizes, um, causes the voltage to fluctuate a lot and, and oscillate. And then after one and a bit cycles, it settles back down and there's no other effect. So clearly that voltage is not within 10%. It goes up to a um, 60% increase roughly. Um, but that might be okay because it's over a very short period of time. Whereas if the voltage overall was more than one and a half times what we, what the component that we were trying to plug in needed, it would probably damage the component. So there's a transients. Um, you also get um, harmonics. So this is um, notching. You get these little periodic notches um, caused by a three phase converter. This isn't something that decays away to zero. This just You'd expect this to occur and keep going. And again, it's not like it's necessarily a different voltage magnitude. Um, it's that the the actual shape of the sine wave has been changed. And for harmonics, we usually deal with them by adding additional um, sinusoids at different frequencies to produce this net effect um, and analyze it in that way. And there are various other types of disturbances. So we talked about um, this was a type of harmonic that was added, notching. Uh, I think there's notching here in, in part C as well. Uh, a has a, a much larger disturbance in uh, harmonic distor dis distortion. There's noise, so a very high frequency harmonic that's added on here. Uh, we talked about sags and swells, um, and you might get um, a surge, a particular kind of surge in um, in voltage as well. So all of these kind of add together to maybe make something like this ITI curve. So this is for some types of compo um, particularly computer equipment that's designed to this. They say steady state. We really do want the voltage within pretty a pretty tight boundary. But if it's only you know a fraction one millisecond, it can go up to twice. So twice the nominal frequency, the fre uh, sorry, twice the nominal voltage, the voltage that it's meant to be. So this, this sort of transient would be okay. In fact, if it's, if it's 0 0.01 of a cycle, 
So a real short spike, it can go up to five times. So this would be a, a much more sort of specific definition of what we mean by power quality of how much harmonic distortion, how kind of much can a transient cause deviations in voltage or frequency um, and how what is the acceptable envelope of voltage and frequency and change of uh, shape of this curve. So that's the first bit, add a specific power quality. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about reliability. So let's say we have this network. Um, what I mean by reliable is if you know there are there are faults, there are um, damage or problems caused by two individual components relatively regularly on a large network. So if we lost, let's say that line, could we still, through all of the other connections, keep the network running? Um, and ideally, not just keep the network running, but provide supply to the households um, that needed it. So we could say, you know, we would expect the system to stay running with the loss of any single component. So maybe that transformer breaks. Could we still supply it through these in feeds from other places? What if this generator gets uh, a fault on it and disconnects? What if there's a bus bar fault? What if there's a line fault? Um, but it's not just as simple as that, because with wind speed, uh, with a lot of wind turbines, there's a kind of continual variation in um, the amount of uh, power coming into the system. Same with you know, uh, loads changing quite regularly um, with people changing demand. So can we cope with that variation? Um, there's also much more correlated ones. So this was sort of a graph of um, solar variation. Um, in a particular time and obviously there's times where there will be quite a lot of cloud cover very low power outputs there'll be times where they'll be high can we deal with that rapid variation um i guess i could talk more about that um for those who need it and we talk a lot about fle generator flexibility um but yeah also sort of larger correlated failures caused by external events so there has been a lot in the news about wildfires wildfires can affect very large areas of a country and will cause damage to multiple components. Uh, we'll also change load profiles um, in terms of where people are and what devices they're using. Um, there's uh, droughts, but there's also floods and tidal waves. Um, and all of this causes damage to the system, can cause damage to the system that we want to um, mitigate against. We want the system to stay running regardless of what's happening. Um, I was going to say these are natural events. These are certainly natural events, although exacerbated by climate change. Um, but there's uh, very much um, non-natural events. Um, when I wrote this, uh, although actually it's still relatively recent, there in the US, there was um, a situation where someone was physically shooting uh, transformers in a substation, um, obviously causing quite large damage there because it's not easy to replace a high voltage transformer um but then there's also uh um i don't think i've got a slide on it but there's been cyber attacks um and because uh substations are becoming digitized they're they're more there's more of a risk of cyber attack because more of the network is being exposed to net uh, more of the power system network is being exposed to a IT comms network. Then there's also uh, kind of coming back to the droughts thing, that question of do we have that the right primary energy availability? Um, there's been discussions of, um, I guess, the impact of the big fluctuations in gas prices caused by uh, the Russia um, Ukraine conflict. There's been discussions around whether hydropower is the right solution because there's been long term droughts. Um, and some countries rely very heavily on hydropower and having a large availability of water um, uh, flow of water to be able to power their country. So, all of that is one of the aims is managing external events that can cause um, problems with the network and making sure that 
under a reasonable set of contingencies of external events, our system's going to stay running. Next one was, so we did power quality, we did reliability. The next is to those who need it. Um, and this is sort of taking a, a global view. Um, most of the world has high electricity access, although it's a very uh, minimal definition of electricity access. This just means for a few hours a day, someone could charge a phone or, or plug something in. Um, it's not it's not reliable. It's not 24 seven. It's not large power, de uh, power demands. Although, although there are still um, countries around the world where there's actually quite low electricity access. Um, that is decreasing over time, uh, both as a percentage and as an absolute number. Um, but that's still, you know, close to a billion people who don't have even that very minimal can plug in a phone for a few hours a day um, kind of level of access. Um, and if you look a bit in a bit more detail at how much power do people in certain countries use, you've got some countries with a really high power draw compared to others. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of energy poverty or, or difference in terms of who can access energy and what rel how reliable that is and what the cost is and whether that's affordable for people in that country. And that's another kind of global challenge. Um, the next one was environmental impact. So you've probably seen things a little like this before, but if we go from... Um, so 10,000 BC was around the time of behaviorally modern humans. And that's why I chose that as the start date. If you go to, um, sorry, 100,000 was behaviorally modern humans. 10,000 was start of agriculture and settlements, very roughly. Um, and there's, that could arguably be natural variation, um, although it starts to, peak into something that's a bit more unnatural. This is CO2 concentration, which is very well correlated uh, historically with uh, global temperatures, global surface temperatures. It's really around this spike right at the end that is the bit that I'm interested in. Um, so if you look, so 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing and uh, James Watt's steam engine had started being commercialized. So it was being sold at a bigger scale. And you just see atmospheric CO2 co concentration just really skyrocket there with an expected impact um, on temperatures. So in terms of the annual CO2 emissions, if we're now looking from 1799 up to the present day, it really was only... I don't know, early 90s, where we started to see a decline in emissions in, in uh, Europe first and then the United States. Um, China, uh, I don't think it's reflected here because they had such a sharp increase, but they're definitely uh, causing uh, changing quite rapidly as well, um, and, you know, as is the world overall. And if there were no climate policies at all, if we'd kind of continued on these rapid ramp rates, we'd expect a global increase of sort of 4.1 to 4.8 degrees C, which would have fairly catastrophic effects in terms of, you know, wildfires and droughts and floods and um, all of that, uh, and ability to grow crops and in, in areas that we're used to growing crops. The policies we've got in the moment, because a lot of countries do have policies, um, should see us with a 2.5 to 3 degree uh, increase in global surface temperature, um, given that at the moment we are seeing an increase on uh, the 1990s kind of temperature that we, we were sort of planning for, or the, the sorry, the, um, the temperature change we wanted. If all of the things that the politicians have said they will do come into place, that will happen, uh, the, the increase will only be two degrees, although Many people are pushing for a 1.5 degree increase, which would require quite a step change in what we do. So us as an industry um, are, are causing a large issue. We're causing a large benefit as well. Um, but if we're not, if this stuff isn't to get worse and we're 
we really do need to sort of change what we're doing. So there'll be a lot of talk about that sustainability. And just to briefly say that um, there are a lot of policies in place. Um, net zero targets currently cover 88% of emissions, which is pretty good. Um, although those targets might just be pledges or declarations rather than stuff in law or in an actual policy document saying this is what we will do. This is how we'll do it. So this is, you know, there's work going on to try and improve this as well. And finally, cost, or the next one is cost. So the UK electricity price has been gradually increasing. Um, and if you look globally, there is a large variance in cost. So Germany is one of the highest electricity costs in US dollars per megawatt hour, up at sort of $340 per megawatt hour. Uh, Mexico. Um, is one of the cheapest in the world with more like 60 or $70 per megawatt hour. Um, and part of this cost thing is a trade-off between reliability and environmental impact. Um, so for some countries where the cost is very high, you might hope, expect, um, that that's because they want a very reliable system that doesn't damage the earth. Or it might be that they just don't have the um res the natural resources to be able to, to take advantage of that and get lower costs so different countries have different challenges there and overall the this leads to what's called the energy trilemma you're trying to balance three things at once that trade off against each other you can certainly improve the sustainability you know if we switch to entirely using wind and solar well it would be very expensive and it wouldn't be particularly reliable because the wind doesn't necessarily blow when we want to use the power equally if we had massive redundancy uh in terms of far more let's say gas plants in fact plants of all types um than we needed um our sustainability would probably drop and our affordability would drop so we can trade off between these three things um, and that's the real challenge in what we're trying to do um, and what the overall aim is, is to balance out this energy trilemma to make stuff that is sustainable, reliable and affordable. And I think, oh yeah, and the challenge with doing that and one of the sort of the big broad challenges is that we have to deal with things on a milli microsecond kind of time scale but also on a decade time scale you know from 10 to the minus 5 up to 10 to the positive 9 seconds we have to have long term plans around well what if there are more droughts should is hydro the right solution what's the geopolitical status of this access to this natural resource that we have to buy in versus are our switching devices going to respond? Is our protection systems um, suitable for what we need? Um, much, you know, in much shorter timescales than a, than a single cycle of fifty or sixty hertz. Um, these are the sources. So, but I'm going to skip over these, and we'll, you know, for those who join the course, we can talk more about where this comes from and. Um, where to find your own versions of this information um but yeah i think that is the end of the lecture part of it um i'd love to have more of a discussion and hear some questions so please please post in the, the q a section if you want to know anything on the webinar that's great thank you very much for that james yeah um please feel free to um post any questions in the q a um with any follow-up questions you have on that um, it's a really good introduction to, um, you know, a number of topics that you'll be studying um, on the MSC, Online Sustainable Power Systems Engineering. Um, so any follow up questions about that will be you know, really valuable um, for everyone there. I'll quickly um, introduce you to the MSC course for those who haven't applied yet. Um, but this is a course that the University of Manchester offers um, online. Um, it's an IET accredited program and we offer a full master's program or you can also do a PG diploma 
or a PG certificate. Um, so the full master's program will take um, two and a half years part time. Um, and it's a bit shorter if you do the PG dip and PG cert. Um, it's a really flexible program. So if you're if you're currently working full time in in um, engineering and power systems, um, you can work this program around your, your your professional commitments. So we recommend about 15 hours of work per week um, to complete. You know, lectures, reading, um, independent research, all of that. So um, it's quite manageable if you're in full time employment. Um, there is also um, a dissertation. If you do the, the master's program at, at the end of that, you'll do a dissertation project. Um, so the idea of this is to focus on a work based problem um, so that this course will provide value to you, to your employer, uh, to the university as well and the, and the research body that we have here. Um, our next enrollment is September um, of this year, so applications are open for um, this intake, so feel free to uh, get in touch about how to apply. Um, you can also visit the, the, the course webpage and there's instructions there about applications. Um, and yeah, we welcome you to, to apply if, if this is the course um, for you. Um, so I think there is some questions that have come through, so let me just quickly go to the Q&A. Um, so I think, James, this is a good one for you. Um, so does the master's cover much on outage planning and grid planning? I think you're on mute, James. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, the So there's the, the power system operation and economics module um, that covers some related pieces um so we'll we'll certainly look at um transmission investments um we'll look at um unit commitment algorithms um but we're, we're really getting into sort of the the fundamentals behind it rather than the actual um you know what you do if that was your job because the, there's so much in power systems you can't get to the here's how to do a job if you're in this particular kind of role it's more okay what is optimization what things are we trying to optimize for what's the the maths behind it what how do electricity markets ancillary services um and power system economics all join together um uh, and you know some of the examples are around transmission investment. You get particular. Okay, you've got two areas. What is the optimal capacity of a line if we were to build one, given these kind of costs and constraints and etc. Great stuff. Thank you, James. Um, there's a few more questions coming through, so I'll try and get through these. Um, so. One of our uh, audience members has said um, they're working in, in power systems um, for the NHS. Um, and as the NHS is committed to net, a net zero target by 2045, um, it's an exciting time to electrify heat generation and other factors. So um, will the course cover sustainable approaches to reliable N plus N power systems? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, trying to reach uh, net zero. The targets that are put in place, I kind of said in the lecture, both aren't ambitious enough and are very ambitious at the same time. Um, and we don't go through a huge amount of here's the solution because there isn't a clear solution. Um, and we do, uh, so in the smart grids and sustainable energy systems unit, what we actually do in that unit is get people to do literature reviews of what's the latest thinking, what's the latest research in this area. Um, and we'll we'll cover things like energy flows and Sankey diagrams and um, talking about what is the maximum integration of different types of sort of active network management and renewables that you can have on distribution networks um, that enable transitions to net zero. Um, but so no, we don't cover that specific piece. We cover more sort of the broader fundamentals. Thank you, James. Um, there's a few questions about um, the assessment process for the course. So this is probably questions from 
um, yep. of, of the holders. So um, what is the split between exams and written assignments? OK, so I can only talk as they are at the moment um, and because occasionally they do get changed. But as as I speak at the moment of the um, so the the dissertation makes up a third of the course units of the total, and that is all um, written report based of the taught elements. There are eight taught units. Um, half of those are entirely coursework based will give you access to something like Ipsa or Power World or MATLAB or something. And you'll, you know, you'll run some some simulations, you'll do some calculations, you'll do some design work, and you'll do a coursework. The other four are largely exam based. Um, by largely, I mean 70 to 80 percent of those units. So what's that? You've got 80 percent of half of the units um of the taught units is exam based roughly right yeah thank you and oh, um... group project i've just seen that there's also group projects or group assignments yes so um there's only one group project at the moment that's for in the very final unit called um um business cases for sustainable innovations i think so this is as a group you will decide upon some um sustainable innovation and you will pitch it as a look i think we within this company sort of say what company you're in um think we should invest in this area or this product or this uh, project um and you'll work in a group for that um everything else is pretty much individual there, there's some where you interact with each other um but there's none that are sort of assessed um as a group Great, thank you. And is there any um, any percentage of the grades determined by continuous assessment? Is another question. Yeah. Um, so the coursework's it's not really continuous assessment. There's there's some pieces. Uh, so I think two of the units have um, regular sort of question sheets that you submit kind of every couple of weeks. Um, some of those have them, but they're not assessed in the same way. They're just sort of things for you to work on. Some of those actually count towards your final final mark, but they're normally worth about 10%. The others will be coursework. You know, there will be your work over it over four or five weeks, and there'll be a single coursework deadline to hand in a, a video or a written report or something like that. Yeah. And um, one question about um, minimum entry requirements for this course. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, let, let me just bring up the actual list so I'm not saying stuff that's out of date. So the the level we expect is um, a 2-1 honours degree or equivalent in something relevant like electrical and electronic engineering. Um, and within that, I'm particularly looking at um the level of engineering maths and the level of um sort of a circuit analysis type course i'd expect those to also be at this this uh upper second class so two one honors level um for you to get to get in the there is this modular entry route so some people i know have kind of gone through a non-traditional route or are trans transitioning across to power systems maybe they've done a lot of industry work but their original degree back sort of 10 20 years ago wasn't in electrical engineering um for those i still need to see engineering maths i still need to see circuit analysis and, and general power system knowledge but you can if you can evidence it through what you've done in your work um and still you know have a uh, um have a, a degree um in something more broadly relevant uh then that's that's a possible route i think the best way to to work that out is just to contact uh james through study online at manchester and say look this is this is what i've got 
is it worth me applying? And, and I'm, I'm sure he'd be happy to have a quick chat with you or, or one of the other team. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you can, um, for, if there are any more details on that, you can email me at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk. Um, there was a quick question about English language requirements. So I just, I've written an answer for that person. But if you do uh, require an English language test for your application, what I'd recommend is that you apply and upload any evidence of English language that you have now. Um, and then our admissions team will assess your um, application and decide if the further English test is required. If so, we're able to offer a, a online Pearson VEPT test to you free of charge. So I'd recommend apply first and then we can work out the, uh, the English language requirement later. Um, there's a couple of questions here. So one question is about, um, does this course cover um, sort of latest uh, innovations in um, hydrogen power and, and related things. Um, so is, is there anything that, that, that more such on there? Um, so specifically on hydrogen power, not a lot, um, or very little actually, in terms of how we keep the course up to date more generally. So that lecture that you saw, um, that was part of an update uh, that I did uh, start of this year. Um, and we will be kind of continuing, continually updating various pieces of the course um, to keep it up to date. A lot that said, a lot of what we cover is fairly is fundamental. If you are, you know, a power system protection engineer, might be entirely new to you. If you are um, looking at esters for transformers um, or a substation engineer. Or, or doing planning and outage, um, outage planning, sorry. Um, so some of that doesn't need to change so often. Um, some of it changes very rapidly. So for the um, smart grids and sustainable energy systems, we have a sort of few core general principles, but then it's actually working with the academic literature to pull the latest findings in and discuss them and work with them uh, and apply those to a test network. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, there's another question about practical elements um, on this course with it being online. So how are they done on this course? Yeah. Um, so we will give you access to various pieces of, um, sort of industry software where you can run simulations. Uh, I mean, even for the, the on campus course where the students are physically here, um, they don't get to spend a huge amount of time in the actual high voltage lab, partly because, you know, um, it's things are done remotely and things are done in software first. Um, so at the moment we use MATLAB, IPSA, PowerWorld, and PSCAD as the four bits of software for various um, sort of simulations and setups. And we give you access to um sort of certain test networks and networks that we've done pulled in from our research and kind of simplified down to stuff that, that works well for for this kind of can this kind of work great stuff um there's a question here from a marine engineer um mm -hmm. who is talking about um the switch of uh, marine vessels from internal combustion engines to electric electric powered propulsion using renewable energy is there any way that this course could offer some kind of support um, for, you know, topics related to this uh, switch? Yeah. Um, we've had a few people uh, who work on uh, the kind of marine ships and submarines, um, although not specifically looking to the ships, at elect uh, the electric propulsion. We have colleagues who work in this area though this isn't a machines and drives MSC. This doesn't look at drivetrains. This doesn't look at rotating machines and the design of those. Um, that's a different course. What this does cover is the, the, the system, um, the power system as a whole. Um, so some of what you want will be, won't be in the course. Um, some of it for, what are the main considerations of electrical power systems um, will be very relevant. Um, it's hard to know how much you'll want that's in here versus, you know, whether you want 
something on machines, drives, drivetrains, and electrification, um, which is yeah something slightly different. Thank you, James. Um, a question about in-person uh, events and lectures. Um, so this course is an online course. So the the classes are done online. Um, but if you are ever in Manchester, um, you still do have access to resources on campus, um, the library, the engineering building, and all that kind of thing. Um, so you do have access to things, but all classes are done um, online. Um, you know, we have people in different time zones, so it's not really feasible to do an in-person class. You can attend um, your graduation ceremony in person as well in Manchester, so that will be a good opportunity um, to meet other people on the course um, and academics as well. Um, but yeah, just for that question about um, in-person events. Yeah, um, so we do try and ha also have opportunities for you to sort of chat to each other online. Um, many groups set up like a WhatsApp chat and, and get to know each other through that. Um, I have been saying that I'll run an in-person networking kind of event um, that's not a requirement of the course. That's just a separate, if you're on the course or you're thinking of joining, uh, come. I haven't actually ever run those in the early days. There wasn't enough interest. Um, but I think maybe maybe next summer is the right time because we've got a lot more students on the course now and there's starting to be a bit more interest. Uh, but I can't promise anything. Um, there's a lot of logistics to sort out with um, people coming from all around the world and, and what we'd put together. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, that could be um, exciting times for that. Um, just following up on that, there's a sort of related question about um, live tutorials, on online live tutorials. So is yeah. there... Is there an option for an online tutorial where we can ask questions to academics and work through problems? Yeah, yeah. So all the courses have uh, online tutorials, live tutorials, using something similar to what we're doing now. Um, and those are generally kept free from the actual lecture content, which is pre-recorded, so that you can have these questions. Maybe there's some tutorial problems and you can kind of work through and ask questions live. I don't think anything can replace that ability to say, I'm still not getting it. Can you go through it again? This is the bit I'm confused with and have that back and forth. Um, so they're, they're at least every other week. Um, and then there's obviously there's there's um, discussion forums as well where you can post questions and, and, and interact that way. Um, and every course has uh, an academic tutor who is an expert in that area who you can email and say, look, I'm struggling or this is this is what I've got so far. Um, and so, yeah, you have email, you have discussion boards. Um, you often have the WhatsApp chat with the other students if you as a group choose to set one up uh, and you have the uh, video uh, tutorials where you'll go with questions as well. Great, thank you, James. Yeah, and just following up on, um, you mentioned the, the academic support there. So there's a question about um, support with the um, the course content. So we do also have, we have sort of two support teams. One is more of the academic focused stuff, so working through um, some issues that you have with that. But then there's also um, a, a study advisor team who will guide you through the online platform and deal with any anything, any help there and sort of keep track of your, your progress and support you with any of the non-academic um, aspects of the course. So you'll feel very um, connected and supported throughout, um, even if, with it being online. I think that, you know, there's a good support network there with, with the two um, teams of support. Um, there's a question about the application deadline for September entry. So um, the deadline is August 21st. Um, so do make sure you get your application in before then. I would recommend applying earlier than that, though, um, because they're, like James mentioned, the course is actually um, very popular, especially this time round. Um, there is a very large interest. So just make sure you get your application in as soon as possible so that we can process that um, with plenty of time before that deadline. Um, a couple of people saying they're going to enroll. That's nice. Um, so another question about um, from this applicant who's in the building services um, and they're intending to move to full power systems. Um, so with their background being in building services, would they 
have a chance of admission to this program? Um, it's not an easy transition from building services to power systems. It has been done by students before uh, on this program, but you really have to have already started to make the transition. If you are um, an electrician and have mostly been doing, you know, relatively low voltage stuff on, on a very relatively small scale, you probably you you're possibly not going to be able to make that transition if you're working a lot on um grid connections you're working on much larger more complex sites um and you're doing more of the design work there um then it's more likely it also depends on, on what a lot of what your you know your undergraduate degree was if you did got an honors degree in um electrical and electronic engineering and, and got a two one or a first um then it doesn't matter what um job you're doing at the moment you've reached it through the academic qualifications um so yeah a, a definitely worth applying because people with building services have successfully got onto the course before and done well um but it's not an easy transition um certainly and this goes for sort of everyone um, the the maths is difficult on the course. It is just a difficult course in general. Um, we you know we have a pretty simply good success rate, and, and our, our students go on and do excellent excellent work and can, can do excellent things. But a master's is not a master's in engineering is not an easy thing. Great, thank you, James, for that. Um, I'll answer this question about um, courses. Can courses can two units be taken at the same time? Um, so unfortunately, no. Um, the course units have fixed start dates, so you, you do have to work through um, them according to those dates, so you can't do two units at a time. Um, there is an option to pause your studies, um, and you can come back to a unit later on. So if you're on the MSc, you do get up to five years to complete the course. Um, so you know, it makes it a little bit more flexible if you're busy at work for a period of time. Um, but no, you can't do two two courts, two units at the same time. Um, can, um, I, can I just jump in there as well? We designed the course to be 15 hours a week, and um, it really is that. We, we run um, surveys of the students to say, you know, how long is this taking you? And I think we're, we're averaging around 15, if not a little more. It, if if you took multiple ones at once, it would not be a part time course anymore. It would be a full time thing. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a tough workload. Um, but as I say, you know, people get through it and then find it really valuable. Yeah. Um, another question about the units. Um, so are the units covered on this course the same as the ones stated on the web page? Yes, they are. The web page is up to date with with those units. Uh, there is a description for each unit on the web page. We also have a course brochure with a little bit more information. So if you've received, you might have received that in a, in a previous email from me. Um, if not, you can email me and I'll send you over the course brochure for a little bit more information about the units. Um, and a question about with this being an online degree, um, is there an indication on um, on the certification and things like that that it says online? So it's, it will it doesn't say online on your certificate. Um, it's it's a full uh, master's degree uh, from the University of Manchester, the same as if it was an on campus course. Everything's exactly the same in terms of your accreditation and certification. And um, yeah, and then, about finishing slightly shorter, but yeah, I think we've answered that one. There is a fixed time with them, course start dates. Yeah, the the quickest you can complete the taught period is two years, and then the dissertation. Well, the dissertation takes as long as it takes, and up to a year. Some people manage to finish it in six months. It's unusual to very unusual to finish it in less than six months. The, the dissertation piece. So that's why it's two and a half years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and are the deadlines spaced evenly over the 12 months um, or is the periods with no teaching and other periods with lots of teaching? So I think this is um, 
the, yep. the way the units are spread out over the over the academic year yeah so um there are four teaching blocks um throughout the year uh, those are the sort of the four units you will take each year and those are 10 weeks each and currently they've got a one week gap between them and that leaves um obviously that only adds up to 40 weeks a year out of the 52 so there is a break over the the sort of the winter around the christmas period there's a break around the easter period and then there's a break um actually um kind of before september um a sort of a summer break as well so that's the current structure um of of how it works uh, in terms of when the deadlines actually are within that um the there's normally one on the very the very end um that's normally the the biggest coursework or the the exam uh, on that last friday and then there's normally one or two in the middle perfect thank you very much for that james and thanks for answering all those questions um that was really useful for our applicants so that's great stuff and thank you for asking those questions as well i think that a lot of people benefit from um that information so um that's pretty much all we've got time for i just launched a quick poll um to our attendees so please feel free to fill that in and you can select um yes if you would like to um request a consultation um if you click yes for that i will set that up for you and we can talk further on Zoom or over the phone, whatever's best for you. Um, we can discuss the application process, fees, funding, course content, that kind of thing. Um, you can always email me as well at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk. Um, but yeah, I think that is pretty much everything. Um, so thank you, James, and thank you to all our attendees. Thank you for those questions. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll finish there for today. And we hope to see some of you starting in September. And um, yeah, feel free to contact us anytime if you have any questions. Thanks, everyone.